if you look back at um, uh, the, the, the debates of the past decade after 9-11, and particularly here in the, in the U.S. And, and in the West in general, about sort of the, when, when people suddenly discovered that Arab public opinion, certainly global public opinion at one level, was angry with American foreign policy and what it meant. And the fear, something we haven't talked about so much, was that it's going to drive people into militancy. That's going to have a consequence for mobilizing uh, into action in, in a way that is either destabilizing for the region or detrimental to American foreign policy or, or threatening to the West. I mean, that, that is basically the, the notion. And, and a lot of the research from the West that went into that has been the link between, you know, public opinion and quote, terrorism, in, in mm -hmm. the sense that, that that was kind of the notion, you know, at, under what circumstances do people, you know, revolt under mm -hmm. what circumstances, and, and not just vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and the West, but also against their own governments. Mm -hmm. So we haven't talked about that in a way because that clearly is one of the big issues, you know, the governments have been pretty effective uh, in, in, uh, in, you know, in uh, 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 their own security services, in preempting, in uh, uh, co-opting when, when, ne when they need to co-opt and hitting hard when they need to hit hard. They've learned over time, it's remarkable how entrenched authoritarianism has become in, in the region in comparison to almost anywhere else around the globe. But one of the things that I always believed was it, a, at, at the human level, a driving force for mobilizing into radical action is humiliation. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, I, I think humiliation is, is extraordinarily uh, important in mobilizing people to doing things that they otherwise don't, are not prepared to do in normal circumstances. Uh, and, I, and I think in some ways the, the psychology of the Middle East has been one of humiliation mm -hmm. um, as a region. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at an historical perspective from throughout the 20th century, but certainly for, for a, a good part of it, if not all of it, uh, has been a psychology of collective humiliation vis-a-vis -vis the West, vis-a-vis -vis the world, uh, and, and, and then individual humiliation at the level of the, the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the state, vis-a-vis -vis the, the issues that they care about that they cannot control, and the Arab-Israel issue, which I think remains the prism through which uh, Arabs, the public, sees the world. Uh, it is subconscious prism, and it is a prism of humiliation. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, in, in, in fact, is mm -hmm. kind of, it, it opens up everything else uh, in, in their memory and, and read of history and uh, collective experiences of the 20th century. And so it's possible that despite all of that gap between, uh, you know, public opinion and governments, uh, despite all that media openness, maybe because of it, you have this, uh, you know, uh, in, in some ways diffusing the tension, uh, reducing the humiliation through the kind of mechanism that people have developed to, 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 to kind of develop their own little worlds mm -hmm. through which they can make judgments about where they are and where they belong and, mm -hmm. and, and their sense of self and their sense of worth. Uh, so perhaps all of that is actually not having the consequence of mobilizing people into action. It goes back to the, mm -hmm. uh, that, that maybe, uh, you know, even though people are still suspicious and, and you have the conspiracy theories, at another level, because that world is no longer the central world in their lives, even America in some ways now is just an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for some of them, I, I, I don't say for all of it, because we, we can't, ignore the fact that the U.S. has a huge footprint in the region, even with its reduced power. I mm -hmm. mean, not just in Iraq, but in every country in the Gulf, and, and obviously through political and economic presence in, in, in many Arab countries. But it's not so visible in daily lives to, to individuals mm -hmm. uh, that, that it hasn't really, we, we haven't seen the kind of um, uh, relationship that people anticipated between anger and militancy. Right. I have to tell you that the, the research shows some relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a little mixed. It's not mm -hmm. as clear as some 
would expect there is there is evidence that uh, you know the, the the angrier you are, the more likely you are to sympathize with with, with, with militant groups or or to possibly even to join them. But the, the evidence is mixed, and and at the aggregate level, it hasn't been on a scale. Um, you know, outside of the problem places like uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. where you know, it doesn't take a genius to 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 interpret what what's happening on the ground. It it hasn't had the kind of consequence mm -hmm. uh, in in the rest of the Arab world that people feared. Well, that's true, and the humiliation, absolutely, I believe, is number one problem in the Arab world for, for uh, humiliation is a um, shorthand for so many political, economic stresses, uh, social change, autocracy, foreign armies, what, oh, many, many different reasons for humiliation. But the humiliation is coupled with um, positive, reinf uh, positive reinforcing forces in people's lives. So it's not that people are only humiliated. They're humiliated, they're angry, they're, they feel vulnerable, they feel helpless, but as again, as the research among young people is showing, we've done some work also uh, only in Lebanon, but it's going to spread around the region, looking at the positive assets in young people, people who are like 10 to 15 years old. What is it in the lives of young people? What are the assets in their lives that prevent them precisely from going over the edge from anger, from unemployment, from whatever, and becoming either criminals or terrorists or illegal immigrants or, or doing devious behavior? And we find that there are a lot of positive reinforcing elements that anchor people in their societies, religion, culture, tribal values, traditional Arab uh, values, uh, family, friends, uh, networks. There's just, there's a lot of things, including some of the things that governments have done. I think, you know, we have to be careful not to portray Arab governments as totally bad guys. They are bad guys in terms of being non-democratic, et cetera. But most uh, most people in the Arab world, and when I say most, I'm talking about 80, 80 to 90 percent, I believe, in urban settings and villages can walk to a health center, can walk to their school. The basic access that young people, that ordinary citizens have, except for r rural Yemen and rural Morocco and some very distant places, even in poor parts of cities, most people, if they need a, a medical center, if they need to go to school, they can do that. So that you have humiliation, but not desperation. I think this, this equilibrium, this balance between humiliation, but at the same time supporting elements in your life, we have to understand that better. So we have people who are really angry and frustrated, and part of that frustration is dissipated because of the media effect.